Welcome back to another surprise show. Today we're going to talk about how we can view the Jalo as a window into the drastic changes that were occurring in Italy from mid-60s and on through the 70s. The films of Bava, Argento, Fulci, they were made so fast and with such freedom that we really do get a glimpse into these auteurs subconscious and through the individual we really get a sense of the psyche of a nation so welcome my dear horror aficionados and welcome to a uh, a brief improvisation on the the suspense and the shadows and these blood red gloves I'm Alec Hawkins, your guide through the twisted labyrinth of Jalo Cinema. We're going to unearth a, uh, a classic from the crypts of Italian cinema. The Jalo is a subgenre named after the marketing of certain literary works packaged in yellow. The books of Edgar Wallace, the the murder mysteries of Agatha Christie. These were cheap paperbacks of German English crime thrillers, mass produced throughout Europe. And so, since they were these recognizable uh, yellow paperbacks, people um, referred to them as jolly. So, while there are some some proto jolly. The films really didn't take off until 1970 with Argento's Bird with the Crystal Plumage. We would call the Jalo film a proto slasher because of a lot of a lot of the things that Carpenter's Halloween gets credit for. Hell, a lot of the things that Black Christmas gets credit for were already happening in the Jalo. And you know, filmmakers like uh, Brian De Palma, who get called. Uh, you know, rip off Hitchcock artists. Um, really, what they were were heavily borrowing from you know, Jalo filmmakers like Argento. And I, I love that De Palma is like, yeah, compare me to Hitchcock. Let's not mention that, uh, <laughs> like, man, Dressed to Kill, like, just totally lifts stuff from Bird with a Crystal Plumage. It'll make your mouth drop if you're a huge fan of Dressed to Kill and seen it a thousand times and then you see Bird. Um, but what's so fascinating about these films, especially for me, is not only um, just the beautiful tropes like the, the the killer with the black gloves and trench coat and hat and, and all the variations on that and how um, um, in the early days there's, a, there's an inclination by the filmmakers to uh, have it revealed that the killer is a woman. Um, all, all these neat little things where even at the, at the beginning of Jalo, Jalo's uh, turning the tropes upside down. And then uh, after it does that, you have filmmakers taking these uh, cemented Jalo tropes and then turning them upside down. That's so cool. But the term Jalo means yellow, or if we're talking in the plural, Jali. So picture it, Italy, 1970s. Um, let, let's give some historical content. So in the 1960s and 70s, there was significant social change going down, specifically the legalization of divorce and abortion. So these legal reforms challenged traditional Catholic values, causing a great deal of cultural upheaval and anxiety. And something you'll consistently see in Jalo films, specifically the rural Jalo, um, or or a Jalo where, say, the the lead character is in a new country, like he's a fish out of water. Sometimes he's an American or she's an American vacationing 
in Italy, like with what's been called the first giallo, not bird. You know, bird with crystal plumage in, in 70 by Argento may be like the first like fully formed giallo. But there's a movie from 64 by Mario Bava called The Girl Who Knew Too Much. And, um, you know, she's she's an American vacationing in Italy and sees a crime. And if she could only remember exactly what she saw, therein lies the clue that will reveal the mystery. And that's that's really the great giallo trope, the great giallo plot line. But something you'll consistently see in these films is, um, especially in the Sergio Martino movies, you know, where there's a housewife who uh, who is oppressed by the patriarchy, by the Roman Catholic, um, Italian, just old world. Like you know, she's totally oppressed by it. So she breaks away and has an affair. Um, joins a sex cult or something and by going against the patriarchy by going against the old world she invites a whole new world of problems so across the board a lot of these giallo films are presenting this thesis that yeah something's wrong like this patriarchal society is not working yet um if we break away from it we're doomed um, so maybe maybe it's the subconscious truth that the filmmakers um, are unknowingly putting into the work. This idea that it, uh, us human beings, we, we there's a friction because we live in a fallen world and we have all these fallen inclinations and temptations and passions. So um, we want to break away and be free. And not to mention, you know, the people in authority are totally corrupted, whether it be politicians or clerics. So, you know, what else can we do? And that's why these films are so relatable and so interesting, because we see flawed protagonists, but we understand why, why they're drawn to, to get messy. And then things just, you know, really get messed up. And, uh, you know, these movies are like serial killer movies, but that, that's really a small part of it. Uh, the serial killer is really just a symbol for um, this phallic penetration. This, you know, you just can't get away from the patriarchy. You just can't. So, the sexual revolution was sweeping across the Western world, and Italy was no exception. The giallo genre, with its focus on sexuality and violence, emerged as a reflection of these social, so these societal shifts. It. Uh, the Jalo film often depicts characters grappling with their desires and guilt, mirroring the sexual anxieties of the time. And many Jalo films explore the tension between sexual desires and moral values. Characters often find themselves in morally ambiguous situations, leading to guilt and paranoia. So, if you like the early films of Scorsese, like Mean Streets and what he's doing, man, like the, the Catholic guilt stuff is incredible. I'll give you a spoiler: if there's a priest. And a giallo, very likely, he's the one killing all these little kids. And just wait till you hear the motive. Um, usually, the killer priests in giallo films have the best motives. Um, sometimes in a giallo, you may rewatch that film seven hundred times, and every time you're like, "Which one? Which one is the killer?" Um, I think Kim Newman is the one that talks about that in Cat of Nine Tales. Like, and I agree, I can't tell you who in Cat of Nine Tales is the killer, even though I've seen that film several times, but so and, uh, inconsequential. What's what you got? Uh, all right. Um, another thing that doesn't get talked about enough in Jalo, so let's talk about it now, is gender roles. Jalo films often challenge the Additional gender roles, female characters in particular, are portrayed as strong and independent. See uh, Profondo Rosso, Deep Red, Dario Nicolotti. She, she makes that movie, man. It, it wouldn't be the movie it is without her character. In. And this is a departure from the more conservative roles uh, that women were expected to play in Italian society. Violence and eroticism. I mean, that's what we're here for. Jallo films frequently feature graphic violence and eroticism. They wouldn't be Jallo if they didn't. Blurring the lines between pleasure and pain. 
Move over, Clyde Barker. This reflects the societal confusion about changing sexual norms. And then there's also the sexual thrills. Jello films delve into the psychology of their characters, portraying them as deeply flawed and troubled individuals. This mirrors the eternal conflicts uh, Italians faced in coming to terms with their changing attitudes towards sex and relationships. So it's kind of like you make something legally available. It's a lot easier to do it when before, you know, it wasn't even an option. So, I mean, that's profound. That's profound. And you can really see that in the films. It's beautiful. The giallo genre left a lasting impact on both Italian and international cinema. Directors like Dario Argento, Mario Bava, and Lucio Fulci became influential figures in the horror and thriller genres, drawing on the themes and aesthetics of giallo in their work. So we mentioned De Palma, but, but even later directors like David Fincher. I mean, when you watch Seven, that scene where uh, in the rain where Brad Pitt has chased the killer from his apartment out into traffic, and then they go down that alley past the garbage truck. And, you know, he hits him with the pipe, and he falls down. And he's looking up at him. Watch some of the shots in that scene, and then watch a, a similar scene in Argento's Bird with Crystal Plumage, and you'll be like, man, not only did, uh, did Fincher take some inspiration in how he blocked the scene, but th there's no way he didn't... <laughs> He didn't pop that laser disc in and like, let's rewatch the scene and just kind of see how they got the coverage for this and what angles they got it from. Um, even the hat that Kevin Spacey's wearing with his trench coat, it, it looks exactly the same. Exactly. So, while I emphasize the connection between the legalization of abortion and divorce and how this is reflected in Jalo, uh, specifically in movies um, like what have they done with Solange? Uh, what's the Lucio Fulci one um, about the kids out in the country? Um, mm, can't remember the name of it right now. Um, who saw her die is another one. Don't torture duckling. That's the Fulci movie. So those three are, I would say, those are the big three to watch um, to really see explicitly. Like here, here it is explicitly in the plot. Um, you know, but time is a flat circle. So we also um, have Michael Savastakis and his work on how Jalo is pulling from folktales. And, and that's how we can see these same things repeating over and over again. It's not just because Vatican II started this um, liberalization of Italy in the 60s. It's because these are struggles that men and women have always been facing. So that's why, even though it's very specific, to a certain country at a certain time is universal and everybody can relate to it because in your writing, when you make things personal and specific on a cultural individual level, the paradox is it becomes universal and we can project our own selves into it, like pouring ourselves into an empty vessel, the exact opposite of, you know, using ciphers, uh, and archetypes, although that works too. But from the introduction of this book, I just wanted to read this passage. The Jalo is one of the anomalies in movie, movie making. Since its directors were in, is in Northeast Mississippi, you can come to Columbus, Mississippi, to the Columbus Arts Council to see Hartle Road's record release. Uh, and there's a, a chance that I will be there myself. So come out, say hey, and let's just get spooky.